Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back. This is my second video following on from talking about the Weierstrass product of the gamma function and now we're going to be using it to derive Euler's reflection formula which states that gamma of z multiplied by gamma of 1 minus z equals pi over sine pi of z. Now just to recall what we found in the last video, we now know that 1 over gamma of z is equal to z times e to the z times the Euler-Mascheroni constant times the product from 1 to infinity of 1 plus z over k times e to the negative z over k. Now, with all this reflection formula, as we saw earlier, we need to calculate not only gamma of z, but also gamma of 1 minus z. Uh, and to calculate this, we're going to use a property of the gamma function that we spoke about at the start of the last video. Namely, that gamma of 1 plus z equals z times gamma of z. Now, gamma of 1 minus z can also be written as gamma of negative z plus 1, which can be written as negative z times gamma of negative z, just following the same rule that we used earlier. And this means that there is an easier way that we can find 1 over gamma of 1 minus z. Instead of substituting in this expression here, which would leave us with lots of messy things and not, not very nice cancellation, this is going to be a lot more simple. So to find gamma 1 over gamma of 1 minus z, this is equal to 1 over negative z times gamma of negative z. And this is going to be equal to 1 over negative z times by this entire expression, but with negative z in the place of our z's. So in our case, that's negative z times e to the negative z times the Euler-Mascheroni constant times the product from 1 to infinity of 1 minus z over k times e to the z over k. Now, as you can see, we have a negative z here and a negative z here, which are going to cancel. And so our expression is just e to the negative z or the Mascheroni constant times this infinite product here. Now, our main goal is to multiply the two of these things together. So let's do that. 1 over gamma of z times 1 over gamma of 1 minus z is equal to this expression times this one. Now, our z will just multiply across nicely. We've got an e to the z times the Euler Mascheroni constant here, and an e to the negative z times the Euler Mascheroni constant here, which means these two are reciprocals and will cancel. With our infinite products, we've got a 1 plus z over k and a 1 minus z over k here. These are a factored difference of two squares, which means that we now have an infinite product from 1 to infinity of 1 minus z squared over k squared, and each of our e to the z over k's will multiply nicely with an e to the negative z over k, which are reciprocals, so we can ignore them. So, here is our expression for 1 over gamma of z times 1 over gamma of 1 minus z. And now to move on to the next part of our proof, we're going to need to derive an infinite product form of the function sine of x. Now this is going to be significantly easier than having to do it for the gamma function because it has periodic zeros. Um, but this isn't going to be the most rigorous proof, I'm just going to show you roughly how to go about it. And if you want to find some more resources, there are plenty on YouTube. So just storing that aside for now, let's have a look at sine. So we know that sine can be written as a Maclaren series, as a polynomial, and as a result of that it must be able to be factorised. Now any factorised polynomial, for example a quadratic, can always be written as the sum of each of its factors or each of the points at which it crosses the x-axis where it is zero. We can see that with the quadratic that I've demonstrated here. At negative two, the quadratic is equal to zero. With sine, if we think about what the sine function looks like, it is reaching zero at infinitely many points to both the left and the right of the y-axis, but these are very predictable. We know it has its first zero at zero, its next one at pi and negative pi, its one after that at 2 pi and negative 2 pi, etc. Which means if we want to solve the expression sine x equals 0, we know that x must equal some integer multiple of pi, like so. This means if we want to write x as an infinite product, we'll call 
any coefficient of the polynomial that we're pulling out, big A, which itself will be an infinite product, which we'll deal with and solve for later, because we just want to deal with the brackets themselves. Uh, the way to think about that is that sometimes when you have quadratics that have a coefficient that's larger than 1 on the x squared term, we factor that out and then deal with it again later. That's what we're doing here so that we have some nice brackets, all of which have an x and a plus or minus some constant inside of them. We're going to take our x as equals 0 as a solution, and we're now going to write our sum. But actually, sorry, our product. But actually, we're going to first think about if we can see a pattern here, because otherwise we're going to have to go all the way from negative infinity pi to positive infinity pi, and that's not a particularly nice product to deal with. So, as we said before, our first, zero, our first zero that's not at x equals zero is x minus pi, our next one is x plus pi, our next one after that is x minus two pi, our next one after that is x plus two pi, etc., going off to infinity. And what you might notice about all of these is that they come in pairs, each of which are also factorized differences of two squares, which means that we can write this as ax times x squared minus pi squared times x squared minus 2 squared pi squared times x squared minus 3 squared pi squared going off to infinity. And this is a much nicer infinite product to write. It's the infinite product from 1 to infinity of x squared minus k squared pi squared. So this is great, we're almost done, we just need to find out what a is. Now we're going to use the Dirichlet limit, or at least I think it's called the Dirichlet limit because the integral of it is called the Dirichlet integral, and this limit is that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. I'm not going to prove that in this video, but there are plenty of great proofs that you can find online if you're not convinced by this. Now we've already said that sine x is equal to a times x times the product from 1 to infinity of x squared minus k squared pi squared, which means that if this limit is true, then the limit as our expression of x over x as x approaches 0 must also equal 1, which means that the limit as x approaches 0 of ax times the infinite product from 1 to infinity of x squared minus k squared pi squared divided by x must also equal 1. There's some nice cancellation going on here with our x's on the top and the bottom. And so now we get that a times this infinite product from 1 to infinity of, well, as x goes to 0, we're going to have nothing here. So just negative k squared pi squared is equal to 1. Now let's divide, or at least just observe that a must therefore be the reciprocal of this infinite product at every single point in our product namely that a is equal to the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 over k squared pi squared in order to cancel out the reciprocal of this product and leave us with just 1. So <clears throat> let's use this information to look back at our original equation. We're going to multiply this infinite product by this one. So let's think about what x squared divided by negative 1 over k squared pi squared will be. Well, x squared divided by negative 1 over k squared pi squared will be negative x squared over k squared pi squared. And negative k squared pi squared divided by negative k squared pi squared will be 1. And therefore, we have now finally arrived at our final destination, which is an infinite product form of sine x. So I'm now going to write out our gamma function that we just arrived earlier of gamma of z times gamma of 1 minus z being equal to z times this product from 1 to infinity of 1 minus x squared, oh, oh sorry, of z squared in our case over k squared. And you can see immediately how similar these two expressions are. If I just change all my x's here for z's, which of course I can do because the variable doesn't matter as long as we've changed it everywhere, we've got a z matching, we've got an infinite product from 1 to infinity matching, and we've got a 1 minus z squared over k squared matching. The only thing that doesn't match is the pi squared here in the denominator. So how could we get rid of that? Well, if we substituted in z pi for all of our z's, then we'd end up with z squared pi squared over k squared pi squared, and our pi squareds would cancel. So let's do that. 
sine pi of z is equal to pi z times this infinite product of 1 minus pi squared z squared over k squared pi squared. And so the desired effect has happened. Our pi squareds can cancel out on the top and the bottom, leaving us with infinite products which perfectly match. And the only difference now being that we have an unwanted pi here when all we want is a z. Therefore, if we just divide by pi, we have equivalent expressions. And this leads us to conclude that sine pi of z over pi is equal to 1 over gamma of z times gamma of 1 minus z. And of course, all that's left to do now is take the reciprocal. And this leads us finally to Euler's reflection formula, which states that gamma of z times gamma of 1 minus z is equal to pi over sine pi of z. So this is a great example of one of many uses of the infinite product form of the gamma function and also of other functions. It allows us to see relationships which otherwise might not be so clear. Uh, such an incredible identity to know and this is very useful in all sorts of areas of maths, particularly in evaluating integrals that involve the gamma function as often trigged functions are a lot easier to deal with since we know their derivatives much more easily. Speaking of derivatives and the gamma function, the next topic that we're going to look at is the digamma function. And the digamma function can be defined as gamma prime of z divided by gamma of z, which is also the derivative with respect to z of ln gamma of z, noting that the derivative of the inside is gamma prime of z and the derivative of the outside is 1 over gamma of z. And I mentioned this at the end of the last video too. So my task that I'm setting you is to think about how if we know that gamma of z is equal to z to the of 1, then all we need to do is think about taking the natural log. And perhaps think about how this repeated multiplication can be manipulated into a sum and how from there we can start finding out what the derivative of the gamma function might be and the uses of that. Thanks for watching this video, I hope it's been helpful and I'll see you soon.